functional demands. For example, its activity quickens or slows the heart, constricts or dilates the blood vessels, controls certain internal secretory processes, initiates intestinal peristalsis. Two opposing subdivisions make possible this accommodation to changing demands. They are known as the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Each consists essentially of a separate neural network, thus providing a double innervation to smooth muscle and many secretory tissues. Through the functioning of these two subdivisions, the normal healthy individual maintains a balance between organ or system function and the demand placed upon it. An imbalance between these two subdivisions, however, may result in the development of one or more well-recognized clinical conditions. Among the diseases in which autonomic imbalance is considered to be a prominent etiologic factor are such varied diseases as essential hypertension, gastritis, peptic ulcer, pylorospasm, intestinal hypermotility, mucus, spastic and ulcerative colitis, hyperhidrosis, and other conditions not easily classified, but which are characterized by vague subjective symptoms and few, if any, objective findings. For a great many years, these conditions were associated with what was called nervousness, a term which has given way to the more descriptive term, situational stress. Situational stress is the term now used to describe the sum total of life situations which, consciously or subconsciously, result in tension in a particular individual. It is now thought that in susceptible individuals with tension of this type, there develops an imbalance between the two subdivisions of the autonomic nervous system, with a resulting more or less constant barrage of neural stimuli over the parasympathetic division. This parasympathetic imbalance has been called vagotonia, or parasympathotonia. In order to have a better understanding of diseases resulting from this imbalance, and in order that therapeutic approaches may be more logically applied, it is desirable to review the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. The cells of origin of the sympathetic subdivision are situated in the lateral horns of the gray matter of the spinal cord from the first thoracic segment to the third lumbar. The axons of these cells travel through the anterior nerve roots and synapse at one of two ganglion sites with the single exception of adrenal innervation. One of the ganglion sites to which sympathetic fibers travel is the sympathetic chain. This structure consists of some 22 ganglia which lie near the spinal column and extend from the base of the skull to the coccyx. Some preganglionic sympathetic fibers pass through this chain to the second site, which consists of the so-called prevertebral group of ganglia. Included in this group are the celiac, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric ganglia. Since neural impulses travel over these fibers prior to ganglionic synapse, they are known as preganglionic fibers. But regardless of the actual site of the ganglion, the preganglionic fiber synapses with a ganglion cell and its fibers in turn carry the impulse from the ganglion to the innervated organ and are known as postganglionic fibers. Further, each preganglionic fiber is thought to synapse with several ganglion cells, thus accounting for the diffuse nature of the sympathetic discharge. The second subdivision of the autonomic nervous system is known as the parasympathetic system. Preganglionic fibers of this subdivision leave the central nervous system from the hypothalamus, the midbrain, the medulla, or the second, third, and fourth sacral segments of the spinal cord. Those from the hypothalamus innervate the secretory glands of the posterior lobe of the pituitary. Those leaving the midbrain travel to the ciliary ganglion where they synapse with postganglion fibers providing parasympathetic innervation to the eye. Some of those from the medulla become a part of the seventh cranial nerve, travel to the sphenopalatine or to the submaxillary ganglion from which postganglionic fibers innervate the lacrimal and salivary glands. In a similar way, other fibers reach the otic ganglion by way of the ninth cranial nerve and postganglionic fibers 
innervate the parotid gland. This parasympathetic innervation to the eye and to the salivary glands explains some of the side actions commonly seen in the use of drugs acting on the parasympathetic division. However, most of the parasympathetic preganglionic fibers which leave the medulla are contained in the vagus nerve and are distributed to the thoracic and abdominal viscera. Unlike the fibers included in the third, seventh, and ninth nerves, the preganglionic fibers of the vagus do not synapse in well-defined ganglia, but connect with ganglion cells situated within the substance of the innervated organ. Thus, the preganglionic fibers of this group may be very long, and the postganglionic fibers very short. The parasympathetic outflow from the sacral section of the spinal cord originates in the lateral horns of the second, third, and fourth segments, emerge in the anterior roots of these spinal nerves, form the pelvic nerve, and terminate around ganglion cells lying in close proximity to the pelvic organs. These postganglionic fibers innervate the descending colon and the pelvic organs. To summarize the anatomy of the autonomic nervous system, the fibers of the sympathetic subdivision arise from the first thoracic to the third lumbar segments of the spinal cord. The preganglionic fibers proceed usually to well-defined ganglia where synapse is made with postganglionic fibers which in turn travel to the innervated structure. The preganglionic fibers of the parasympathetic subdivision arise variously from the hypothalamus, the midbrain, the medulla, or from sacral segments of the spinal cord. These fibers travel to well-defined ganglia for structures of the head and neck, but the ganglion cells associated with thoracic, abdominal, and pelvic viscera are within the viscera themselves. The physiology of the autonomic nervous system should also be reviewed, since its understanding is necessary to the clinical application of the so-called autonomic blocking agents. It is generally accepted that neural stimuli are transmitted to effectors by means of chemical mediators. Such mediators also serve in the transmission of the neural stimulus across the ganglion synapse. The chemical which mediates such transmission at the ganglionic synapse of both subdivisions is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine also acts as a mediator at the postganglionic effectors of the parasympathetic subdivision. However, at the effector site of the sympathetic subdivision, the chemical mediator is a substance which has been called sympathin, the exact chemical nature of which is still under dispute. There is considerable evidence to support the view that there are two sympathins, and that one is epinephrine or adrenaline, and the other is norepinephrine or arteranol. It is probable that it is this difference between the two subdivisions which permits the application of therapeutic agents to clinical conditions characterized by an imbalance of the autonomic nervous system. There is considerable confusion in the terminology of drugs which act on the autonomic nervous system or which provide effects simulating its activity. Properly, drugs which mimic the activity of the parasympathetic subdivision are parasympathomimetic, and those having an action mimicking the sympathetic subdivision are sympathomimetic. Conversely, the inhibitors are known as parasympatholytic or sympatholytic. Further, since acetylcholine is the mediator of the parasympathetic subdivision, the terms cholinergic, adrenergic are frequently used to indicate a drug action, as are the terms anticholinergic and adrenolytic, although these terms were originally employed to describe nerves and not drugs. The physiology of the autonomic nervous system limits the sites of action of pharmacologic agents to three. And in each of these sites, it is possible to effect either stimulation or inhibition. These three sites are, first, all autonomic ganglia, since acetylcholine is the mediator in the ganglia of both subdivisions. Second, the effectors of the sympathetic subdivision, where sympathin is the mediator. And third, the effectors of the parasympathetic subdivision, where acetylcholine again is the mediator, but where, for reasons not understood, drugs act differently than they do against acetylcholine in ganglionic mediation. 
Stimulation of the autonomic nervous system, which is accomplished by the so-called excitatory drugs, can be brought about by one of two types of action. First, a drug may act to inhibit the mediator-destroying enzyme and thus permit the accumulation of the chemical mediator. Examples of this type are physostigmine and neostigmine, acting within the parasympathetic subdivision. Ephedrine may act in a similar way at the sympathetic effectors. Second, excitatory drugs may act by supporting the normally occurring mediator or by acting on the innervated structure as does the mediator itself. Small doses of nicotine provide this action at the ganglia. Uracoline or pilocarpine cause this effect at the parasympathetic effectors. In a similar way, excitation or stimulation may occur at sympathetic effectors and an example of this type of drug is epinephrine. Inhibiting agents or blocking agents also act at one or more of three possible sites, but their action is usually that of competitive combination so that the normally occurring mediator does not cause stimulation. Examples of drugs which block at the ganglia are tetraethylammonium, pentamethonium, and hexamethonium. Examples of drugs which block or inhibit only at the parasympathetic effectors in usual dosage are atropine, hyoscyamine, and scopolamine. A few act both at the ganglia and at the parasympathetic effectors. Such drugs are probanthine, banthine, and dibutylene. Drugs which block at the effectors of the sympathetic subdivision are a special case in that no drug known at the present time blocks all adrenergic functions. Ergotamine, the hydrogenated ergot alkaloids, divenamine, piperoxane, and prescoline will block the blood pressure raising effect of epinephrine, but not the tachycardia which epinephrine causes. The newer drugs, which act in therapeutic doses to inhibit neural transmission at the ganglia of both subdivisions, as does tetraethylammonium, and which also inhibit at the effectors of the parasympathetic subdivision, as does atropine, allow a considerable therapeutic advantage over previously available blocking agents. One of these is propantheline bromide, more commonly known as probanthine. It has relatively little action on the normal cardiovascular system, which advantage has increased its sphere of practical application. Atropine and its related alkaloids act at only one site, the effectors in this subdivision, and are well known for their prominent side actions and for their toxicity when given in adequate dosage. Tetraethylammonium, a newer drug, must be given parenterally and is insufficiently selective in that it has too great an activity on the vascular system so that orthostatic hypotension is commonly associated with its administration. Many clinical conditions which are characterized by disturbances of the autonomic nervous system are commonly thought to be due to an overstimulation of the parasympathetic subdivision. This excess stimulation is considered to be a prominent factor in such diverse conditions as gastritis, peptic ulcer, and hyperhidrosis, and in some types of pylorospasm, biliary dyskinesia, pancreatitis, intestinal hypermotility, spastic constipation, and mucus and ulcerative colitis. This excess parasympathetic stimulation, or parasympathotonia, is but the neural manifestation of a more basic factor or disturbance which is not as yet understood. Most authorities, however, are of the opinion that this basic factor lies in the psyche and is the result of environmental situations commonly spoken of as situational stress. If this basic concept of parasympathotonia is correct, the proper treatment for permanent relief in this class of conditions is the elimination of existing stresses. Unfortunately, this is often impractical or impossible, and it is therefore necessary to rely on medical or surgical interruption of the resulting shower of parasympathetic stimuli. Surgery of the parasympathetic system has been resorted to in the treatment of colitis, hyperhidrosis, and of peptic ulcer. The results obtained by surgical procedures are not always entirely satisfactory, and in general, they are now reserved for certain specific or limited indications. At the basis of medical treatment of the parasympathotonic conditions lies a determination of the degree of stress to which the patient is subjected. When an estimate of the stress has been made, dosage of the anticholinergic drug is prescribed accordingly, and a lesser dosage will not adequately offset the imbalance. 
Needless to say, the patient should have the benefit of other forms of treatment, such as diet, rest, and relaxation, which are usually a part of these treatment programs. As regards specific therapy with probanthine, clinical evidence indicates that the average patient will be adequately treated by the administration of one 15 milligram tablet with meals and two tablets at bedtime. Those patients with severe evidence of parasympathetonia will require an increased dosage, and as much as eight tablets or more per day may be safely prescribed. All patients should have the benefit of antacid medication, diet, rest, and relaxation as needed. Another consideration in the clinical use of these drugs is that of maintenance dosage. It is readily understood that in most of these patients, their basic factor of stress is still present even after the disease manifestation is brought under control. Therefore, maintenance dosage of approximately one half the therapeutic dose is commonly recommended after adequate evidence of control or healing is obtained. From a practical standpoint, this maintenance dosage may be two or three tablets daily. Thus, the therapeutic principles involved in medication with anticholinergic drugs such as probanthine are, first, dosage to fit the degree of stress effects operative in the individual patient, and second, maintenance dosage if the original stress has not been eliminated or resolved. These newer therapeutic agents represent a major advance in our ability to control disease conditions, and their development has gone hand in hand with a better understanding of the etiologic factors operative in disease and health. Their proper use is possible and ever for the medical profession to serve humanity better.